Anbernick is back with another new device. I guess they still don't have a marketing team though, because this device is also just a bunch of seemingly random numbers. The RG405M. It features a metal shell, a 4x3 aspect ratio screen, hall sensing analog sticks, and introduces a new controller layout for Anbernick devices. I used to think of Anbernick as the company to beat when it came to the handheld emulation market, but lately, others seem to have caught up and I've been experiencing quality control issues with several of Anbernick's devices over the last year or so. Every new device feels like they attempt a step forward, but they end up one or two steps backwards. How does Anbernick's new device hold up? Is it finally the forward momentum Anbernick needs to continue their foothold in what's becoming a very crowded market? We're going to take a look at the RG405M's hardware, software, and emulation performance to see if this new device is finally Anbernick's step forward. So make sure you're subscribed and let's get right to it. The Anbernic RG405M is a visually striking device for Anbernic. The analog and D-pad are swapped with the left analog stick on the top left of the device rather than at the bottom. The start, select, and function buttons are all in new locations compared to what Anbernic usually does. The start and select are on the bottom right, with the function button on the bottom left. It's great to see that Anbernic is pushing their devices beyond just updating their chipsets, but actually approaching the design of their devices from new perspectives. I'm also really happy to see that Anbernic is not plastering their name all over the front of this device anymore. We don't have any Anbernic branding on the front at all, not even at the bottom of the screen, and it looks fantastic. The screen itself is not the highest definition screen on the market, but it does offer a new take on the 4x3 aspect ratio screen. It's a larger 4 inch screen, which in comparison to other 4x3 devices makes a really huge difference. The screen has very small bezels, which really let your games shine. If you put other devices side by side, it does not get to the same peak brightness, but the lower brightness is fantastic for gaming at night or to not disturb somebody next to you. The back of the RG405M has the anti-slip grips found on many of their previous metal shell devices and a printing of the device's info. The RG405M specs are very similar to one of Anbernick's previous releases, the RG505. The RG405M has a 4-inch IPS touchscreen with a resolution of 640x480. The CPU is a Unisoc Tiger T618, the same found in the RG505. It's got a Mali G52 GPU, 4GB of LP DDR4 RAM, 128GB of internal storage, built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, runs Android 12, and has a 4500mAh battery. For the gamepad on the RG405M, the ABXY buttons are rubber membrane and for the most part, do feel good to press. I did find that when I was stress testing, you can angle the buttons so that it scrapes up against the shell. This not only leaves a mark on the buttons, but can also make the button feel like it's getting stuck. We'll make sure to cover this a lot more when we get into gameplay. The D-pad continues to be the best-in-class D-pad we usually see from Andronic. The analog sticks are hall sensing. And while these designs haven't been around as long as other features on Anbernic devices, they do feel pretty good. They have a really good range of motion, and the L3 and R3 click-in feels good too. At the top of the RG405M, we've still got the side-by-side -side triggers. They don't feel bad and have a nice click, but I usually just don't find them very comfortable, especially for more modern emulation like GameCube or PS2, which more heavily rely on triggers. On the top of the device, we've also got a vent for airflow, a USB-C port for peripherals and charging, a volume rocker, and the power button. The bottom of the RG405M is pretty minimal, featuring just two speaker grills on either side, a 3.5mm headphone port, and the micro SD card slot. One thing notably missing from this device is the HDMI out functionality. This is something that's also missing in the RG505, but can be found on the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, all of which have the same chipset. So it seems odd that it's completely missing from this device too. 
Pricing for the RG405M starts at $178 and is available in two colors, gray and black. If you want the included micro SD card for preloaded games, which I never recommend, you're looking at $193 for an included 128GB card and $208 for an included 256GB card. None of these prices include shipping, which is an extra cost now through Ambernix website. Turning on the RG405M for the first time, in classic Ambernix fashion, we have kind of a disconnected animated anime background and a first time setup screen. The system reconfiguration is a bit of a mystery to me as far as what it's actually doing, and it's got some random buzzwords on the screen like software and simple easy. The configuration takes a surprisingly long time, about 2-3 to three minutes. It's only a long time because it's completely opaque as to what it's actually doing. When the setup is done, you get a configuration setup is done, please click message. I think it wanted you to tap, but I hit A twice and that worked too. On the home screen, we've got four pages of pre-installed applications. This includes pre-installed emulators, and unfortunately this means some pre-installed emulators that are actually supposed to be paid for, like the DS emulator Drastic, or the pro version of the N64 emulator. On the plus side, we do have the Google Play Store pre-installed, but unfortunately, that means that we've also got these sketchy ones as well. Actually, once I signed into the Google Play Store, a few minutes later I got a notification saying that one of these sketchy app stores was disabled by Google Play Protect. There's also Anbernix's own front-end launcher built-in, which I absolutely despise. I've always found it to be unfortunately an awful application with just nothing of value at all. You can set it to be your default launcher by swiping from the top of the status bar and toggling the Anbernix logo. I still don't think the launcher is good. A launcher's goal should be to not get in the way, and that seems to be all Anbernix launcher actually does. There are a lot of unintuitive things here like how to change themes, the strange decision to combine Wii and GameCube into a single system, and the opaqueness of actually adding new games at all. Luckily, the only thing that is easy about the Anbernix launcher is exiting. You can swipe down from the top of the screen and just toggle off that Anbernix logo. Another toggle that we'll find from swiping down on the screen is a performance toggle. I can't seem to tell the difference when the CPU is on auto versus high when it comes to game performance, but the toggle is there for experimenting, I guess. This isn't a new chipset or difference in RAM from the RG505, so the actual performance shouldn't vary too much from what we've seen in the past, so we'll focus on how gaming on the RG405M feels. My experience with the RG405M was actually great up to this point. I always start with lower systems just to get a feel for the system ergonomically. When I booted up Super Mario Land for Game Boy, as I started playing, I noticed my A and B buttons felt a bit off. I'm not sure if this is a manufacturing defect in every unit, or I'm just unlucky, but when I'm holding the B button to run in Mario and then trying to hit A to jump, a lot of times my A button will scrape on the edge of the shell and I won't be able to press it down. I could adjust my hand to make sure I don't have that issue, but this is a pretty major flaw for gaming. Over time, I'm hoping that the A button just gets worn down a bit to fix the issue. But this is another quality control issue when it comes to Anbernic devices, and it really brought down my overall opinion of this device. I really thought that this was the Anbernic device to change things and turn things around. It's been getting great reviews online, so I was really surprised to find that I also didn't feel the same way. While that did put an end to my testing of Game Boy games just because it completely kills the vibe of playing Mario on this device, it didn't stop me from trying other systems. The A button scraping against the shell is not something I experience on any other of the higher end systems. N64 felt great and looked really good on this device. For PS1, I just upscaled a little bit to get some higher resolution graphics, which all looked and felt great. Dreamcast performs well, even the harder to emulate games like NBA 2K. Super Nintendo had no issues with harder to emulate games, and because of the button layout, I also didn't run into the A button scraping issue. 
Even though the RG405's 4x3 aspect ratio is definitely not ideal for PSP, it actually didn't look so bad even with the letterboxing. Games performed well as you would expect, so while I wouldn't say this is my go-to PSP gaming device, it's great to know that it can handle it and that the games look alright here. When we get to more demanding systems, you can expect a lot of GameCube and PlayStation 2 to be fully playable. It won't play either's entire library, but you can get quite a lot running. We can also take a quick look at Switch emulation. AAA games like Super Mario Odyssey won't get very far or render properly, but Celeste actually runs really well at a full 60 frames per second. Moving to Android games and ports, even though Minecraft performs fine, I had some button mapping issues. Minecraft wouldn't detect the R2 button, and this is the same exact issue I had on the RG505. I also got Half-Life, Half-Life 2, and Portal ports up and running. I did have some button mapping issues here, but I didn't spend too much time trying to fix it, but performance-wise, they run great. So is the RG405M worth picking up? It does have an overwhelming amount of fantastic things going for it. The screen size is great, the device feels super premium, and it's comfortable to use. I'm always a fan of metal shell devices, and I like the 4x3 aspect ratio with a larger screen size and the smaller screen bezels. I think the analog stick above the D-pad layout makes a ton of sense when we are starting to get more and more powerful devices, and I hope that Anbernic sticks with it. But the A button scraping against the metal and having a true impact on my gameplay is the one hangup I have about this device. It didn't stop me from enjoying playing other games, but it's too bad on a device that was so close to Embernic's best has this one huge issue. We also have to consider that this is a crowded market, and it would be crazy to discount some of the other devices that are out there, especially depending on what your needs are. While the RG405M has a lot going for it, it is on the expensive side. The Retroid Pocket 3 Plus just has an unbeatable price. For $30 less than the RG405M, you get a seriously amazing device with an incredible screen. It's certainly not as pocketable, and it doesn't have that premium metal shell, but it does have HDMI out, and the Retroid Setup Wizard and Launcher are some of the best we've seen in the emulation handheld market. If 4x3 aspect ratio gaming is your thing though, Ambernix 405M is a great device as long as you don't have the same button scraping issue that I did. So what do you think of Ambernix's latest handheld, the RG 405M? Are you getting tired of these generic device model numbers like I am? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. Throw a like on this video if you found it helpful. You can also follow me on Twitch where I do unboxings and gameplay testing streams from time to time. Don't forget to subscribe here on YouTube and thanks for watching.